beneficial to pollinators. Not just neutral or less negative, but actually have our farming practices promote the health of pollinator populations. And that is something that no farms really are thinking about right now. They're thinking about how to diminish their impact on pollinators, not how to promote them. So my wife, Elizabeth, and them, and myself, we are singing Frogs Farm. We're right here at Sebastopol, right behind Rabel Park on Hill Station Ferguson Road. We look at the back side of Rabel Park. And I just came from the farmer's market this morning. I got up at 5 o'clock this morning, and I've been running all morning selling produce. And so I didn't see the morning presentations. So I hope that I don't uh, replicate anything that already said. But I do know that I'm definitely coming at it from a very particular angle as a farmer. Um, and I've got a lot of experience and research in both big scale farms on down to the small scale farms, what we are. So Singing Fox Farm, um, we've been around about six years, about three acres of production on a nine acre parcel. Uh, the rest of it's all wildlife habitat and infrastructure. Um, we are a CSA farm, first and foremost. We have members year round, getting fresh produce from our farm year round. We also do a couple year round farmers markets, a couple more seasonal farmers markets, and a couple restaurants as well. Um, that we supply food to. And we are unique in a number of aspects. One of those is that we are absolutely a no-till, no machinery farm. We are hand labor and hand labor only. No rototillers, no tractors, no horse trawl plows, no tillage. Totally. Oh good. I'm asking my presentation story was gonna be part of that. Um, and secondly, we don't use sprays of any kind, not organic sprays, not conventional sprays. And we use very little organic fertilizer. We use a heck of a lot of compost. Like Cheryl mentioned, if you want to modify your soil in any beneficial way, compost, compost, compost. Um, however, our compost is not manure based, it is vegetable based, totally vegetable based compost. So there's a lot of benefits for that, and you avoid some of the side effects from manure compost. Anyway, I do want to get started. Um, so I'm going to start big pictures food and farming and pollinators and work on down to how all of us who do have relationships with farms can maybe change or modify our actions to help support the things that we do care about. The United Nations Environmental Program estimates the value of pollination services at 190 billion years per year worldwide. That does equate to one-tenth of all the agricultural productivity or activity on the planet. One-tenth. That's important. We lose our pollinators, we have to replace that. That's 10% of the agricultural activity is from pollinators. Um, the vice chair of the World Economic Forum, or the former executive director of the World Food Program, we're entering an era of permanent food crisis. Um, over the next 40 years, we need to produce more food than we produced in the last 8,000 years. More caloric food energy between now and 2050 than since the year 6,000 BC. On this planet, we have to produce a lot of food really fast to feed the population at a healthy rate so there isn't malnourishment and so we all can achieve our full potential. Um, I'm not going to keep reading slides like this, I don't like reading slides, but these are important quotes. Uh, worldwide, approximately 1,000 plants are grown for food, beverages, fibers, spices, medicines, and they need to be pollinated by animals in order to produce the resources on which we depend. Which leads to the very simple quote, bees are not an option. <laughs> Sam Droge, good friend. Um, so, excuse me while I refer to some papers once in a while, because usually I talk without the PowerPoint. I'm going to have to follow my little script here a little bit. Um, <clears throat> colony class disorder has probably been talked about a little bit this morning, maybe not. Uh, but what was Cheryl had a great slide on the number of commercial hives. There's no silver bullet out there saying, ah, you're the culprit. That's why we have the class disorder. But there is the compounding effects of environmental toxins, poor nutrition, and habitat loss. Um, and PFSP partners for sustainable pollination, the V symposium right now, why you're all here. One of our missions is to work with all the people, landowners, scientists, um, land management agencies, and backyard gardeners even, People who are concerned with pollinators and working with pollinator habitat to get us all to work together towards providing better pollinator habitat and fodder resources. Um, so, thank you all for being here at PFSP. 
I'm actually um, one of the volunteers at PFSP and an outreach coordinator. So I frequently do a lot of presentations for PFSP elsewhere. Um, okay. So, the obvious one, right? Um, environmental toxins. It's, you, again, you can't point the finger at silver bullet and say some pesticide is killing off bees. But you can say, and this has been documented through numerous different research studies, all of those environmental toxins weaken the immune system of the bee. So when you look at a colony class story, you look at a hive that died, they say, well, it only died from varroa mites, or it died from some other virus or disease. Well, yes, it died from that disease. That disease has always been present in honeybee hives for centuries. But at this stage, with the amount of environmental toxins that we have in our environment, those bees are dying because of that disease that have been able to survive in the past. It's overloading their immune system. And mind you, my family, we buy it. Or, sorry, stop it, Jenga. <laughs> my mic's there. My family and I, we buy organic whenever we can. It's something that we don't grow ourselves. But I'm also going to say organic, while it's so much better than conventional, is not good enough. That picture, that could be an organic farm. That could be an organic pesticide or an organic fungicide. We can't tell. That could be organic. That poor guy. Um, hey, go Argentina. Your right? sister should be. For sure. <laughs> <laughs> That's a hell of a little job. Um, when we first started farming, my background was in tropical agroforestry. So my background was really looking at whole ecosystems and how to make them healthy through agroforestry, the introduction of perennial tree and bush species into annual crop fields. And therefore, my background is really ecology, not agriculture or farming. I wasn't trained in farming. I was trained in ecology. And my master's degree research was really in how to revitalize degraded landscapes in the tropics. Taking a landscape that had been just completely devoid of life for a couple hundred years from overgrazing and everything else, and turning it back into a productive, healthy ecosystem for the landowner. In addition, also providing, obviously, food, because that's their economic income, is the food the farmer would sell. So we got here to the States, back to the States, my wife and I, we started singing Frog's Farm six years ago, and I had never worked with any kind of sprays or pesticides at all, because in the tropics, often people couldn't afford it and it wasn't available. So we started having cucumber gables, diabrotic. I don't know if it's there either. <laughs> um, <laughs> is it too loud? No. No, no, not back here. Um, I just won't walk forward, that's all. But the cucumber beetle was decimating everything. It was decimating our beans, our eggplants, our cucurbits. Um, it was decimating everything and ravaging it. So I went to Harmony Farm Supply, the purveyor of all things organic, and I said, well, what can I do? And they offered me an organic insecticide. And I sprayed it on one bed row. I was like, I've never used a spray. It's kind of I'm getting nervous here. <laughs> so yeah, I'm going to spray one bed row about 80 feet down and come back the next day and the next day after that, next day after that, and look and look and look and look something happened. I'm not seeing a lot. I wasn't very observing, but I wasn't seeing a lot of death. Yeah, so I tried to second the spray on it. Still didn't seem to have an impact. So I actually ended up catching 15 cucumber beetles, very easy to do, put in a mason jar, and I took a very concentrated form of the insecticide, insecticide, concentrated form. And I pumped it into that little jar until it was two inches deep, packed it, shook it up, and put it on the kitchen table. They're swimming in this, right? They're drowning. In it. Six of them die within hours. Nine of them persist for at least a week. Happy as can be, swimming around in the backstroke on a kitchen table in insecticide. So I said, well, what's going on here? What's wrong with that picture? So I go back outside of the field, and I look at that bed row really closely going, I don't get it. What's going on? And I was looking down at the soil instead of the leaves. And I looked at the bottom of the soil there, and I was realizing overturned carcass of a ladybug, overturned carcass of a lace swing, overturned carcass of a praying mantis. All the beneficial insects were being wiped out. Not the pests. It never occurred to me that a pesticide kills indiscriminately. I just assumed that pesticide kills pests. And I was sort of mistaken. And in fact, this was an organic pesticide. And it was killing the beneficial far better than the pests. That really got me. Um, 
Since then, there, or, there have been other studies done. I love going to conferences to get the scientific research because I keep wanting to use that to help mold our direction in farming. And it's been a wonderful um, experience. One research recently, uh, UC Santa Cruz, they looked at one honeybee visiting one flower with an environmental contaminant, whatever you want to be, fungicide, herbicide, insecticide, automobile exhaust, but one bee visiting one flower with an environmental toxin or contaminant, went back to the hive, and through social interactions, 98% of that hive became contaminated in 24 hours. Wow. So while uh, Partners with Sale Pollination and our Bee Friendly Farming program certainly recommend spray the dust and spray when bees aren't around. I still really push for no sprays, period, organic or otherwise. Um, I want a spray that kills everything but isn't dangerous. <laughs> we have two little kids, my wife and I, and age five and three. And they can run through the fields eating whatever they want, whenever they want. That's not something you can do on a certified organic farm using certified organic sprays. And you definitely can do it on a conventional farm. Don't get me wrong, conventional is far worse. But even certified organic farms using organic sprays, my kids could not run free on those farm fields eating whatever they wanted because, well, hazards to humans and domestic animals, my control. This is actually, there's two Insecticides, the rotenone and the pyrethrum, that are considered some of the worst, most toxic organic pesticides. They are often considered more deadly than conventional pesticides. But remember, to be organic, all you have to have is to be derived from an organic source. So you're not being derived from petroleum oil or a chemical source, you're being derived from a natural source. It still is something that is designed to be toxic and kill life. And you look a little further down that red arrow, this product is potentially pathogenic to honeybees. Very specifically, it says avoid applying to areas where honeybees are actively foraging or around beehives. Now this one I pulled out to show you on the slide. This isn't the, the uh, rope known or the pyrethrum. This is a third one. So it's kind of like everything possible out there as you keep looking into it is toxic to life. Um, there's actually one other thing I wanted to mention about. Oh, yes. Um, so the rotenone and pyrethrums, part of why they're deadly, uh, not only they're super deadly to fish, but they induce symptoms resembling Parkinson's disease in mammals. We're mammals. That's organic spray, doesn't it? So you don't want to be asking about organic, you want to be asking about no spray, period. Um, then it isn't always about the environmental toxins affecting the pollinators directly, in this case, this is environmental toxins infecting the beneficial microbes in the hive that convert the pollen to bee bread. And you look at the top dish, and that's a standard healthy beneficial microbes doing their work and converting that pollen into bee bread. The lower one, got a fungicide treatment. So the microbes are being wiped out that allow the bees to produce their food source. It doesn't even affect the bees, that's affecting their own food source in their hive. And if you go further with it, there was a study done in France a couple of years back where they looked at the health and strength of the second generation honeybees based on the food resources given to the first generation honeybees. I.e., how well do you feed the parents and how healthy are the kids? Well, duh, the better you feed the parents, the healthier the kids are. Scientifically, you still need to prove it to make legislation that enforces things that won't enforce. And they found very distinctly, when you reduce the amount of food options, and you reduce the food quality, the second generation born after is much less healthy and has a weaker immune system. So already, they're weakened by their parents' food options. It kind of brings you to this. Do you want to have a nice, diverse diet for your strong immune system? Or do you just want to have a single thing over and over and over again, three meals a day for a month? What's going to make you stronger and healthy? Um, I'd actually love to jump forward fast to that as an example of one food source every meal of the day for a month. That's an almond orchard. And here in California, we produce 99 to 100% of the commercial almonds in the US. But back to here, 
Talking about food nutrition for the bees, why has the nutritional value of fodder and forage for the bees gone down in the past century? And the reason it's gone down is because you have fewer farms with larger acreage per farm. What used to happen is that borderland at the edge of farms where the fence was, that's where all the perennials hung out and all the weeds hung out and all the meadow grasses hung out and they were able to exist there and the bees would make use of that. So you have small farms, lots of borders, lots of bee habitat. Big farms, very few borders per square mile, much less bee habitat, much less selection available for them. And I'll show you some pictures soon that will even more explain that issue, that problem. But back to um, lack of food resources. Um, about 1.6 million beehives are in California right now in the, in the almonds alone. That's of about 2.5 million hives commercially in the U.S. So 70%, 65% of all U.S. commercial hives are currently in our almond orchards right now. Um, and then when they leave the almond orchards, those beekeepers have to go find some other forage for their bees and often they end up in North Dakota, up in Meadowlands up there, but they're trucking their bees all over, desperately looking for good food sources for their bees because they've got hundreds of thousands of hives in them. Not just for the one month of the almonds, but for the next 11 months of the year. And so this is not what they want. This is not ideal, but this is the reality for many commercial beekeepers. There's no food out there for bees. Oh, good old Salinas. Salinas produces 80% of this nation's fresh vegetables in the month of February. The month of February is the dead of winter. Most of the U.S. can't produce food. Salinas produces 80% of the fresh vegetables in the U.S. in the month of February. So everything we've been eating this past month has been coming from Salinas pretty much. Look closely, if you can, you can. Um, what do you see? What's the color surrounding each farm? What's the color that separates one plot from the next plot? Brown. brown. What's brown? Dirt. Dirt, fair dirt. Where is the hedgerow? Where is the native pollinator habitat? That could be organic. That could be conventional. There's no habitat. Again, zero habitat. But that's food production. That's modern farming and food production. That could be organic. That could be whole foods. And that could be where you think you're putting your conscientious dollars to support good farming practices. But we don't know. We don't know which it is. Fair dirt. Fair dirt. No habitat. Um, getting to tillage briefly. Um, us humans love tillage. Us guys, I don't know what it is. We just oh, we have to rip off the earth and turn it over and you know, totally conquer things. The Romans were the most adept at, not the adept, they were the most uh, in love with tillage. They would often till six, seven times a year. It was just ridiculous. They just thought, let's go to the ground again. It's great. Um, there's all kinds of issues about carbon sequestration, nutrient management, soil organic matter. There are so many issues with tillage, and I'm going to stick with just the pollinator issue, and it's 1% of the issue. But California has over 1,600 native bee species. The vast majority are ground nesting. How are they potentially going to, there's ground nesting. I love them just bubbling out in the soil. You get, I have these colonies where I'm like 100, 200 different holes and pulling out of the ground over a week or two. It's just wonderful to watch them come to life in the spring, late winter. But how is that possibly going to survive in the face of tillage? Now I'm showing you big ag pictures here, but I actually want to bring it back down to Sonoma County and small ag, to our farmer's market farmers, my friends and neighbors, because that's an important thing too. We think we're being good. We are being good by buying local. No question about it. Again, I love buying local, but I'm trying to help convince other farmers to change some of their ways. That's one of my big goals in life, and I'm doing a lot of farmer to farmer workshops. This farmer actually had this post on their organic farm page website. They're not from Sonoma County, but they posted on their organic website as an advertisement for, look, we're getting ready to rip the soil, it's great. <laughs> Nothing can live. Snakes can't live, mice can't live, kill deer who nest in bare dirt can't live, your ground nesting bees can't live. Brief question? I 
Um, download. <laughs> about whether if you have your own farm in the back and you have lots of meadow grasses coming up, should you just mow the grasses, should you till, how do you do it? I do lots of farmer training workshops and in fact, same farm farm tomorrow, between 3 and 5 o'clock, we're having a farm tour. Come on out and we'll talk all about how to convert your meadow grass fields into vegetable production without clothing. It's a long, complicated process. What's that? Nesting habitat. We like to do, and a lot of our dirt, and a lot of the dirt tracks of our roads, our roads are otherwise grow clover and grass. We get a lot of ground nesting bees in those dirt tracks, but mostly it's under our perennial hedgerows. Our perennial hedgerows, we heavily mulch for the first two years because our weed pressure is great at Sandy Cross Farm. We have such close surface water in the soil that grasses stay green year round. They never go dormant in ground. So we have heavy weed pressure, so we keep a heavy straw mulch under our perennial hedgerows the first two years while their baby is getting established. By the time they're established and begin branching out, they shade the soil beneath them, the mulch has decomposed, you have healthy, deep organic matter under the perennial hedgerows that stays bare and clean year round and becomes excellent habitats for ground nesting bees and snakes and everything else. And snakes are a good thing. Somebody up here was saying, well, what about gophers? What about gophers? Snakes. <laughs> um, Actually, this is a fast one. Speaking of tillage, I just can't resist. The Dirty Life on Farming, Food, and Love by Kristen Kimball. She was a New York office person, had a great job, and she decided to retire in upstate New York, I guess it was, and she wanted to, um, she wanted to farm, go back to nature. And this is her only account of her story. And there's one section where she talks about tillage. She starts off, don't let anyone tell you that growing vegetables is not a violent act. The muted sound of a plow tearing through roots in, is almost obscene, like the sound of a fist eating flesh. Before planting, we have to raise the ground. Any farmer who tells you that has to talk to me. No way. Totally disagree. Um, it, let's see, where are we going to go next? That was just brief on tillage. But we're looking basically at habitat loss, environmental toxins, poor nutrition. So let's get to the fun part. Gloom and doom, it only takes so much. Hedgerows and habitat, I've heard that some people are already talking about that this morning. Fantastic, I will show some more examples and talk more about it a little bit. No-till, I've already brought up a bunch. Ecological pest management, there's integrated pest management. Integrated meaning you use some ecology and some sprays and some this and some that. Great. It's better than the alternative has been. Um, I want to keep moving it further towards the ecological realm. Mm -hmm. And then we're storing again, which goes back to your hedgerows and habitats. So, obviously, balanced nutrition is best supported by growing diversity of plants. We all know that. We want to increase ecological biodiversity in the crop areas, as well as non crops. So, in crop areas, we do things like grow polycultures in close proximity. Um, in fact, the field beds right in front there are a combination of broccoli and oh. butterhead lettuce. Yeah. Yeah. Am I too loud? No, no you're perfect. 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 Um, so, that first field row right in front, you've got broccoli and lettuce, broccoli, lettuce, broccoli, lettuce. Well, what happens is as the broccoli grows up, it shades the lettuce. And while that broccoli is growing, the lettuce goes sideways and helps suppress weeds for the broccoli. It also happens to shade the soil increasing your soil moisture content and reducing your irrigation costs so that we use 15% of the water of all of my neighbor and friend farms. Wow. I asked them what they do for irrigation, they say three to four hours of drip per day. We do about two hours of drip per week. Wow. So you can mix your berries, your flowers, your herbs, your vegetables, mix them all together. Get those flowers in the month. The oregano is uh, the attractive, absolutely. Get your oregano out there with your vegetables. And I'm talking still farms, but also backyard gardens. Um, we love adding the vertical elements she mentioned. It helps add shelter, Cheryl mentioned. It helps add shelter for the bees from all those birds coming in. So go from your fruit trees on down to your clovers and everything in between. Um, combine your perennials with your annuals and leave some of your leafy crops like your bok choy or patsoy or something like that. Leave it to flower because those flowers not only taste really good for you, but taste really good for the bees first. Let the bees have a shot and then go in and harvest those flowers off or save them for the seed. 
You also want to increase the ecological biodiversity, obviously, in non-crop areas. We have talked about this, so I'm going to go fast. But leave areas of farm undisturbed, provide habitat, restore and enhance existing natural habitat, connect your on-farm habitat to nearby natural areas. If you've got a creek, Cascader Creek, Honey Creek, connect yours in there. Make a corridor for the animals um, and pollinators. Um, provide sources of water, shelter, nesting materials, and don't leave your roads bare dirt. Why? <laughs> it's dusty. It's just awful. Clover. Clover works great. We like to get the... It's got a various couple names, but the North Coast Dryland Pasture Mix is a seed mix of harmony. Or if you go to the balusters, I think they often call it the Marin Sonoma Dryland Pasture Mix or Mendocino Dryland Pasture Mix. Anyway, it's a Northern California Dryland Pasture Mix, so it's going to be very drought tolerant, very summer growth. It's got grasses and clovers in there, and the ones most suited to your particular farm or your particular backyard will succeed and take over, and the ones that are less suited will die back and disappear. So get that mix, and it'll solve the problem for you of which one's best in your area. Okay, uh, do we have to do with um, the Cheryl? Well, she said that there's many ways to do it. You can solarize, you can till, you can mulch, and there are many ways. And I, I will say, when we establish our farm field for the very first time, we do this or till. We have to get it in break the soil once and once only, and then we establish permanent beds, and we only do broad forking, which doesn't even turn the soil. It just loosens and opens the soil. It doesn't impact mycorrhizal fungi. It doesn't impact earthworms. It doesn't impact soil organic matter. Tillage, tractors, disking, horse-drawn plows, any of that, that all kills your mycorrhizal fungi, kills your earthworms. It reduces your soil organic matter. So we are absolutely no-till, but you at some point to begin the process. We have done a few fields where rather than tilling, we've began with sheet cardboarding the entire thing, and then putting compost on top of that, and letting it sit for about a month, getting watered, and then we transplanted it into the compost. And by the time the roots got down to the cardboard, it wasn't there anymore, so they went right through. So we did do a sheet mulching with compost conversion for two fields, and other fields we've done the whole tractor, tractor conversion at that point. And how would you compare that? Because I do a lot of sheet mulching, and that's what I'm always pushing people small scale. Awesome, good. Stuff on. I love the sheet mulching. Easy. But I do recommend letting your grasses die back quite a bit, or even just weed whacking first and then putting the cardboard down right away. Put that compost on to hold it in place. The longer you can let it sit there, the better. Or your very first crop on there should be a very short rooted crop. Go for lettuces, go for beets. Don't do broccolis or carrots. Don't do a deep rooted crop for the first crop. Do a shallow rooted crop so that you still have time for those grasses to decompose. Because as they're decomposing, they're consuming nitrogen. But I'm talking farming techniques for that. And I want to get back to the pollinators too. So thank you for the questions. Um, so here's a good example again back to farm fields and the periphery around them, the edges. One of those pictures, the bare dirt roads, is Salinas. The other picture is the United Kingdom. Vastly different land management practices. One that supports pollinators. One that absolutely doesn't and goes to the great lengths to exclude Mother Nature. I like that. Um, some various hedgerows. A lot of these pictures are from some fellow certified bee-friendly farmers here in Sonoma County. I'll talk about that. Um, most of these pictures right up front, the first four or five pictures, are from vineyards here. I think some of these might be Lou Preston, Preston of Dry Creek, um, and a couple others. So again, look at that wonderful perennial hedgerow on the left, but you know, bare dirt road. So we can get that clover in the road. It really isn't that hard, but that hedgerow is fantastic. That is a really healthy, well-established 10-year-old hedgerow doing a great thing. It's adding wind protection, it's adding a little bit of um, just overall climatic protection for the area next to it. Um, one of that deeper in the farming pot. Um, first stage of planting out your transplants of perennials with mulch around them and a little bit of irrigation to get them started. And then a year or two later, boom, habitat. Wow. And especially what I like about this is it is perennial habitat. Annuals, when you put down annuals, you are increasing the abundance of flowers available to your pollinators from April through August. That's when annuals will flower. They already have abundant food April to August. Like Cheryl said, it's that August around April that is when the lean season is, when there's a dearth of food sources available. So go for your perennial coyote bush, great solution to the autumn and winter. There's a purple aster local native, great solution to a late fall winter. Eucalyptus does start early off in February as the DPHs, so I don't think that's a good be as much, but 
There are a few others. Um, anyway, so you want, I'll get to the list soon. So some more hedgerows. Another hedgerow next to vegetable fields, which is great. Um, what's that? Great. Yeah, and back to the United Kingdom again, where they love their hedgerows, thankfully. Doesn't look like elderberry? I can't tell. I'm not sure. Um, bottom left is our neighbor, a conventional vineyard. Upper right is Singing Frog's Farm. Wow. Um, lots of crop diversity and lots of non-crop diversity areas. From ponds, we have six ponds. You can see some redwoods down in the lower part. Um, there's, throughout the fields, we've got about 3,000 Sonoma County native, pollinator-friendly plants that we have put on our property in the past five years in addition to what already existed. Those are perennialized, pollinator-friendly plants specifically, about 3,000 of them. Um, it's been an investment, but I will say, we don't have pests. <laughs> Just flat out. I mean, our Brussels sprouts, for any of you, I've seen some of you at farmer's markets, for any of you who've gone to Brussels sprouts this year, they were clean. And Brussels sprouts are never clean. You don't find organic Brussels sprouts because you cannot keep the aphids off them. And ours were clean without spray. I'm just curious, how did you solve your cucumber beetle problem? I think I wanted to live with some nature. Um, so timing is good. I'll get, to, I'll get to some more of the solutions about that in a second. I want to show some quick pictures. So like here, we've got some peas. This came out, this is a picture of this week, and a lot of these pictures are going to be this week. So there's three beds of peas. On the left, you see some frost blankets that are over some broccoli, I think, with some escrow in there. On the right, you've got a bit of a hedgerow with some straw mulch. Outside the hedgerow, you've got our grass road. In the background is a grass road with a fence. That fence has fruit trees along it. In the front foreground is a grass fence with the, I mean, the grass roadway with the clovers. Um, again, a hedgerow, woody perennial hedgerow on the left. More crops, intercrops. Uh, we got cauliflower and on that there, um, the grass road in the back, the clover. Um, you can see the grass road on the very far right, the clover actually flowering. This was last October, I think. And then um, we have our flowering hedgerow, and then we get our beds going there. Um, we have two beds there that we've just planted with peas, so they're black right now. They don't have any growing. And then the next two beds up just got new transplants. You get the hedgerow in here with the straw mulch, and then the wonderful thick grassy road with clover flowers just starting. Love clover flowers. Peas love the clover flowers. Some of the roads that are really heavily traveled um, do get dirt, permanent dirt marks down them. Those permanent dirt areas do actually be, become terrific habitat for ground nesting bees. They love it. Um, we have a tractor, I won't deny that. We love its bucket loader because it helps us move compost around. Most farmers put about 20 yards of compost per acre every couple of years, and we put about 200 yards of compost per acre per year. So we need a tractor bucket to move it from our compost piles down the fields, and then we dump it into wheelbarrows, and we wheelbarrow it up and down the pathways, adding it to the bench with a shovel. Where yes. We make about half of it ourselves. All, or again, all the um, green manure, all the I don't want to say that. All the biomass from our vegetable crops and weeding, and the rest is from snow and compost. We've tried grabbing grub, we've tried those never No way. Awful quality. We've had it tested on our own, and it is so low in nutrients and so high in price. Um, snow and compost, you're going to have to live with a little bit of plastic in there. It's the yard waste bins on the street curbside pickup. But know that snow and compost, 100% of the ingredients are Sonoma County ingredients. With those Zamroni, Grab and Grow, they got stuff from Mendocino and Humboldt, they got stuff from Nevada, from Arizona, from Wyoming, from Oregon, coming in. They do a lot of lava rock filler, and when you test the nutrients, we tested a seed starting mix they recommended for me. The seed starting mix had less than 3% of the minimum recommended nitrogen, and less than 28% of the minimum recommended phosphorus and testing. It was worthless, and it cost us 28,000 seedlings that were that all germinated, and then went yellow and basically died. Um, so uncomfortable. <laughs> um, one other thing we like to do with our beds, especially starting now, is down those roadways in the middle, we like to, the head of each bed, like you said on the left, the head of each bed, we like to put flowers for the first four feet, and then do the vegetables behind that. 
So four feet of every bed, every age or hundred foot bed, four feet of that would be turned into flowers, annual flowers. Because annuals still are good, it adds beauty to the farm, but it certainly adds pollinator habitat and water resources smack in the middle of the farm. When our hedgerows are between fields, these flowers are right there in the field too. So you don't have to go more than about, I think about 110 feet is like the longest distance from any flower to perennial hedgerow, so nothing more than 110 feet. And there's a lot of studies of how far pests travel from hedgerows and how far beneficials travel from hedgerows. Um, and beneficials travel further and they'll easily go up to 100 meters and we're looking at 100 feet max on our farm. So we've had a wedding there, which was a great way to show the flower bed ends all the way up um, and the diversity of flowers as well as diversity of flowering times. So broad fork, this is how we one quote till the soil that isn't till it is aeration. You're going down 12, 14 inches with gravity and you lean back, gravity, and it's all gravity power to open up the soil down deep and allow in a little bit of oxygenation and keep your soil alive and healthy so roots can now penetrate deeply. We um, tested our soil for soil organic matter, if anybody you know that term, when we first started six years ago. And we went down 12 inches where you're supposed to and we tested soil 12 inches deep and it was 2.4% soil organic matter. It's actually pretty good. California average for ag is 1 to 3%. So we were at 2.4, that was our starting line. We just tested last month, same field, same depth, 12 inches down, 5.6. To go from 2.4 to 5.6 is a 140% increase in five years. 140% increase. We talked to the Rodale Institute, they will say flat out from their research to go from, to go up one percentage point, to go from that 2.4 to 3.4, they consider that to be not, not readily attainable, but the ideal. Wow. And we went up to 5.6. And then you test higher than the soil, like six or eight inches, and we were at 8% 8 till we're getting back. That benefits your crops, your human health. It gives the crops more strength to fight disease and virus and everything else. It tastes, it tastes a heck of a lot better. <laughs> and it's not your little organic or conventional fertilizer pellet, which is NPK because we are so much more than NPK. Um, I always get awkward talking about <clears throat> my other friends and local farmers, who I'm always encouraging to go no-till. This is a, another uh, friend, but another fellow farmer here in Sonoma County, right in Sebastopol, um, about a mile away from us. And, well, you can see their roads, and you can see the amount of bare soil versus crop cover. <laughs> Can I do that again? I just, this is organic. They are certified organic. That's certified organic. And they're one mile away. Same climate, same soil, same everything. Vast difference. Um, this was sort of a little extra about farming. I am going to go through that fast, or skip through it, I guess. Um, Exclusion? So yeah, somebody asked about pests if we don't do sprays and like that. Well, you can always do the hide and seek game, which is crop rotation. You're always running around your field really fast with your plants so the pests are trying to catch up with you always. So you put broccoli here and you put broccoli over there and you put broccoli over there and you put it back over here. <laughs> the pests are trying to keep up with you. It's hide and seek. Um, but also exclusion. Exclusion can work really well. Um, we have our 200 acre vineyard neighbor and they do a mustard cover crop in vineyards, of course. And mustard is a great overwintering habitat for flea beetles. And every April 20th, as we all know, every April 20th, the entire county gets all their mustard plowed under in one weekend. So in one day, we have 200 acres of flea beetles looking for a new home. And they come to us. <laughs> so exclusion is the only thing we can do for the flea beetle issue, which is propagated by somebody else's land management practices. Our own land management practices, we have managed to actually bring cucumber beetle populations way down through natural ecosystem balance and health. And then on top of that, we know when the first flush of cucumber beetles are, and then they have their egg period and they kind of die back and they have a second bigger flush. We know those flush times and we can transplant all of the cucumber beetle susceptible vegetables in those, in the dips of those, in the troughs of those peas. So we do go in those troughs, transplant right before that trough happens, so they get a two or three week break with almost no cucumber pressure for the plants to get established and healthy. And if they're growing in compost, well, they're going to be healthy for them. And they can fight off the cucumber and not that carry the disease. So, so back to all of you who do have relationships to farms, whether you know those farms or not. 
because you all eat food. Partners of Salem Pollination has a wonderful and very successful program that's been going about four or five years now called the Bee Friendly Farmers and Bee Friendly Gardeners Certification Program. This is all certification program, so all of you can and should do this, whether you're a gardener or a farmer. And that's the metal sign that we have. I bring it to all my farming markets. This is an old map, mind you. This map's about actually two and a half years old. So I got like a half new lantern if I can new update. But I did put that it's over 200 members. Um, we have them in about 38 or 40 states. We've also got Canadian members. We have a few European members. We have some members in New Zealand, <clears throat> all over. But it's definitely a North American effort to get people certified in bee friendly farming and gardening. What does that mean, of course? Well, you do want to have a percentage of your land devoted to food plants for the bees. You've got to create that fodder resource for the bees. And then the either no sprays, which is my preference, or the conscientious applications at dust that we've talked about. And of course, you don't want an extended residue application. Some of these sprays that you use, they will say on the bottle, do not harvest within 28 days of application. What does that mean? It means 28 days of toxicity to life. You really don't want that applied in your backyard garden or farm because that will be affecting the bees not just the day they apply it, if they apply it at dusk for the whole next couple weeks. It will be active and ready to kill. And then of course, as Cheryl mentioned, multiple flowering species, therefore perennials I prefer in all the growing seasons that you can. To do that, there are all kinds of plant lists around. I'm sure there are plant lists right over there. The same list, I can see it right here. Um, and then you get the flowering periods for some of those plants. So if you wanted to create a planting schedule for yourself of perennials, this could be one example of how to create nectar and pollen resources for your bees year round. Honeybees and the native bees, both when I say bees. Both the natives and the honeybees. And all your beneficial insects. I think I covered it. So, Q and A. <laughs> Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, plenty of time for questions, so uh, if you need a mic, give me an extra wave so I can run over. Um, we'll start over here real quick. And if there's no mic, I can repeat the questions as long as it's With newspaper mulch, is there anything toxic in the print paint? <laughs> <laughs> the news is toxic. Um, <laughs> I'm sure there is, but everything in moderation, including cautiousness in moderation. We, our source that we use for sheet mulching, uh, I shouldn't even say the name, there is a bakery, and we have a friend of ours who's a season member who works at this bakery, it's a great bakery, and they get all their flour in bundles on the pallet every day, they get flour and all the ingredients and the seeds and like that, and between each layer of flour and seeds is a sheet of cardboard, and that cardboard has no ink, it has no staples, no packing tape, no list, no nothing. It is just clean cardboard. And like 12 sheets per pallet, and they get pallets and pallets per day. So we have our wonderful friends supplying us with clean cardboard. Um, you can also dumpster dive, which is how we started. And going to hardware stores and getting your clean cardboard that way. It's a lot more packing tape and staples. Newspaper is terrific. There's so much of it produced, very easy to come by. I'm sure there's some kind of toxin in it. I'm also sure that you're getting more toxins in your soil from the Gobi Desert sands blowing off of China coming across the Pacific and landing in California than the newspaper gives. So we live in a fairly contaminated environment. Okay, good. So Backyard Magazine did a study themselves saying that in fact they could not find contaminants in newspaper ink. Terrific. Thank you for that. Yes. So, if I wanted to plant a seedling, and I know I'm going to plant a seedling, and clearly you did, not, you did not do all of these pollinator areas at one time. No. Um, so I am a farmer and also a keeper now, I'm actually a farmer, but how did you start 
trans, you know, obviously didn't transition, but you started doing these pollinator areas, and how would you recommend prioritizing how to do it? I love the little, um, my little story I give on the farm tour tomorrow, three to five or other farm tours. Um, because I come to the very first hedgerow at the beginning of the farm tour, and I look at the hedgerow and I say, we planted this hedgerow from all the species that I had been propagating in my own nursery back at the last place we lived, so I just had them with me, and it was easier to put them in the ground than move to a new house and try to keep them watered while you're installing your bed and walking. So the very first day after closing escrow, Elizabeth and I were out transplanting a hedgerow <laughs> into the field, and we didn't even have a bed yet in the house or food or anything else. We just transplanted the hedgerow the first day. Um, Prioritizing, it all kind of happens together, but you just don't do all nine acres at once. But annual flowers and the pet heads was a great way for me to easily create pollen and nectar resources, but it was at April through August, or April through October. So I'm like, well, how do I get those perennials in? Because the best time to plant a tree was yesterday. We all know that. So really get out there and get that map, draw maps and plans of your property and say, where are the best places I can put perennials? Think about your perennials. Where does your wind come from? Get the perennials via windbreak for you. Where is your sun trap in the sky? Where do you not want to have shade? Where do you want to have shade? How high of the shade do you want? How low of the shade do you want? What deciduous do you want? Um, evergreen. There's very important factors involved. Our hedgerows, that very first hedgerow we put in, it's already got to be about five feet high. We have learned through trial and error, intentional trial, um, that the height of that hedgerow multiplied twice, so 10 feet over, that hedgerow will provide about three degrees of frost protection just for the plants within twice its height and size. They're not over, that hedgerow is not over those plants, it's just next to them. And it provides a more stable microclimate by settling the air, keeping it a little cooler in the hot day and a little warmer at night. So our last crop of summer squash always goes in next to our bedroom. And we always have a frost on about September 20th every year. Last year was September 9th, we had our first frost. But the summer squash, they persisted. And that second frost usually doesn't come until Halloween. So we had six more weeks of harvest from summer squash simply by putting them within 10 feet of a 5 foot high hedgerow. So there's lots of reasons to plant hedgerows. They create the habitat for your songbirds, your pollinators, etc. And they add climatic bonuses to your area. Doing it all at once? I would do it all at once, but in small units. Question? Yeah, I just wanted to ask you Yep. How are you incorporating them? Just lay it uh -huh. on the top. Just lay we it on the top. Incorporation. Oh boy. Let me just talk really fast about rotisolars. Rotisolars. Takes about 20 caloric, 20 calories of fossil fuel energy. Okay. Per bed space that can grow one food calorie of energy, it takes 20 fossil fuel calories of energy. Prep that bed space. So your rotisolar use alone is already 20 calories of fossil fuel energy and one calorie of energy. That doesn't count your sowing, transplanting, weeding, harvesting, and taking to market energy. It's just the rotisolar energy. Now your rotisolar is beautiful at breaking up soil into really fine particles and the tilt afterwards, like, oh, it's just like butter. I can just sink my hands in its cake. It's beautiful soil afterwards. But what it's done is it's decreased the size of your soil organic matter to really fine particle size. That means small, volume, great surface area for each of those particles which means they will decompose much more rapidly. So all of your nutrients in your soil are being released immediately in that month and the next month. And so with a road solar or a tractor, you get this huge spike in nutrients in the first two months, and then it just dips dramatically. Well, very few crops will go to fruition in two months. Your short crops, your lettuces will go to fruition in two months, your radishes. If you want to put broccoli in there, tomatoes, cucumbers, eggplant, anything else, you need four or five months of nutrient crops. And that road soil is going to give you two months of nutrients. And meanwhile, it just off gas a huge amount of greenhouse gases. And it just unsequestered a whole bunch of carbon. So, did I answer the question? I forget. So the broad fork doesn't sell. Lay the compost on top. Thank you.
Um, so broad fork, leaves the holes open. I know I got And then we just throw the compost on top. Um, for every crop we put in, we put down fresh compost beforehand. And we do three to seven crops per given area per year. Most farms do one to three crops. They come in in the spring, wipe the clean slate, put in the human food crop, keep its mother nature away, harvest it in the fall, and then they, they till again and put in the cover crop for the winter. And we do three to seven crops per year for giving you the land. So every single crop, we're putting in brand new compost and run working. And that can be one to three inches of compost every time. It depends on what the last crop was and what the next crop is. Heavy feeders, light feeders, etc. So. so are you guys So we can't till, so we've got to dig a hole, do we not? Yep. <laughs> and fill your bunch of compost? Yeah, definitely. Like Great. Big hole. Sure. Yeah. Um, if you're doing backyard gardening, you don't really need to till anyway. If you're doing 10, 15 tomato plants, you can definitely dig their planting hole if you want and fill compost. We look at it as a process over years, for sure. So we actually, this year, with our soil test coming back, we are finally at the stage where we said, great, we can actually cut back on compost use dramatically. We are cutting out all organic fertilizer like that down to nothing. And we're cutting back compost use by at least half, if not by two thirds, because our soil is so healthy and so full of available nutrients on a permanent year-round basis, not on a spiking basis. So we can add very little now, but that was a five-year process to get there. So the very first year, if you want to dig your hole and put your tomato in, that's great. You have all the undisturbed soil around it. All those organisms will come right back into your planting hole and they'll say, wow, we've got a compost. This is great. And they'll feed their tomato roots from their excrement from the eating of the organic matter. So they create all those available nutrients for you. And then every year, you can add it. Yes? What is your favorite version of Sonoma compost? If we're adding it to fields, we like the high test. It is one of their highest testing nutrient dense composts. If we are putting it into a raised bed, like many of you may have, it's way too nutrient dense and it has too much ammonia in it and it will burn it and you put it in there. So for raised beds, we like to do their Mallard Plus. It has a lot of brown rice hulls added to it. It, it. it aerates it a little bit more, makes it a little bit lighter and not quite as nutrient toxic. <laughs> and that Mallard Plus, it always comes to you fairly dry. It will not hold water for the first week. So we water like three times a day in the bed the first week. It both cools it down and leaches out the excess ammonia, but also it helps build up the water holding capacity in that soil until after a week of doing a couple waterings a day lightly. Then after a week of that, then we can plant into it. Once we've got the established raised bed of Mallard Plus, when that crop is done and you want to put the next crop in, all you have to do is just add like an inch or two of Mallard Plus. That's it, just add an inch. And then you don't have to wait a week anymore. It's just a matter of take out the old plants, Put in the inch in, kind of mix it with your fork, put the new crop in and keep going. And you don't have to wait, it can be the same day, take it out and put it in. But to start it off is kind of awkward because they want to send you lightweight compost so they can get a full truckload. And if they get it wet, it's too heavy and the trucks carry less. And then you pay more in shipping. So. Yes? Um, so are you, do you have a particular plant that does well Um, we're really a strange, special case, our ballet bottom. It is so wet and so cold. Um, coyote bush has done beautifully for us in places that we had biologists come in and say it wouldn't work there because it's too wet, and they have done wonderfully coyote bush. Um, and it's a great one. The bees really stock up on the coyote bush fall at the end of the season before winter hits. We love it. Um, there's a purple aster, a native purple aster. It is able to outcompete our voracious grasses and weeds. Um, this purple aster just kind of keeps spreading on the plank and we mulch around it and it spreads into the mulch and mulch around that and spreads out there. So it's now out of our hedgerows and getting into our roadways. Great, let it go to town because it comes up and it flowers November, December into early January if we're lucky. And that's just like well, golden. I love those flowering patterns. It's really late because all it takes is one day above 55 degrees with calm air and the honeybees will come right out of that hive and find anything they can find to bring it back to the hive and repack that hive fast before it gets cold again the next day. So they love any day above 55 with calm air and so if you have that aster out there Thanksgiving or Christmas, they will find it and use it. 
And you said you have 630 property. Where you have uh, property or spiritual along the riparian area? We did. We have lots of riparian areas, lots of wildlife habitat, for sure. Yeah. That's how we only farm about three acres of a night. Yes? Do you do bats? Bats. We love having bats. We have not needed to put up bat boxes yet because we have a plethora of bats around. We also have a plethora of great horned owls. <coughs> We've got a nesting pair of um, red-tailed hawks that have opened up a big eucalyptus tree. We've got I mean, all those kinds of... Yeah, it's just this wonderful. In the songbird population, we have Phil Persons. I don't think he's here. He um, has grant money to install bluebird nesting boxes on properties like ours. He's put up six or seven on our property. We're very thankful for his work. And we've had great success in each of those boxes producing lots of offspring. Yeah. So. <laughs> Singing frogs farm. Thank you. Um, they used to be called the tree frogs, and they have a new name. What's the new name? Anybody? It's like two years ago they were given a new name besides tree frog, and it's like Sierra tree frog. I don't think it's even tree anymore in the world. I think it's like Sierra singing frog or Sierra. I don't know what it was, but they're the little tree frogs, and they change color according to the environment they're in. So you also find them bright orange or dark green or gray brown or almost a yellow color. Yes, that's what they used to be called, Pacific tree frog. A new name two years ago, I don't know, but Pacific chorus. Is it a chorus? Chorus is a chorus frog. Might be. Thank That's you, my guess. Alice. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll Google. They're prolific, and what's great about them is they're well. Not what's great. What you have to be aware of is you assume, oh, frogs are over in the water in the pond over there. Well, yeah, we have six ponds. They're not in those ponds. They're in the fields. We have had multiple CSA members send us photos of their little Pacific chorus frog <laughs> in their salad bag in their kitchen, <laughs> and said, well, I went to go put it in the backyard afterwards. It was so cute. But they're prolific and they're throughout the vegetable fields. You can't harvest cauliflower without having these tree frogs tucked in the leaves in there. Our whole nursery, you pick up the nursery flats, take it out in the field, there's two frogs underneath that flat. They are everywhere besides the ponds. Are those frogs healthy for your pests? Absolutely. Yes. Thank you for the question. And those frogs wouldn't survive if it wasn't a really healthy environment. Right. Frogs are your canary in the coal mine. They are the first thing to go if you have an unhealthy environment. So we celebrate our frogs on our farm, for sure. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. <laughs> and that is reproduction. Um, and likewise, Doug, the owner of Peak Mind, he has asked me the question before, which is, we put a beehive on our property, and he's added a couple more beehives, and he asked, did it impact your pollination of your crops? Like, oh, that's actually like the whole point, isn't it? Is to assist in the pollination of our food crops. Well, I thought about it and I said, well, our cucumber harvest, holy cow, our cucumber harvest was substantial the year after we had that beehive there. It had not been substantial per square foot of cucumber plants before that. And our peppers, we're getting like 12 or 15 peppers per plant, not three. Yeah, beehives helped, big time. <laughs> so, I think... That should, uh, yeah. that's great now. Thank you very much.